when I was seven years old, uh, my life was interrupted. I broke my arm and it was a really painful experience, but it was painful for multiple reasons. Painful because I broke my arm, but also painful because my life changed. There were so many things that I could no longer do. I couldn't write. I couldn't lift things very well. I couldn't play with my friends. I couldn't play sports. I couldn't go swimming and play tennis and play football, which I loved. I couldn't play guitar. And there was so much about my life that was changed by just this one thing. The good thing about that situation, though, was it was an interruption. I knew that if I just waited things out, if I, if I just was patient, then my arm would heal and life would go back to the way things were. I hadn't truly lost anything. I'd just gone through a really inconvenient interruption. There was another moment in my life where I moved homes. I was 15 years old and my parents decided to move us away from my hometown. And that was a really painful experience. It was painful in a different way because I had to leave everything that I knew behind. I had to leave my school, my, my networks, my friends, my, my sports teams, all the connections that I built up over years and years and years were just taken away, just like that. And I remember after the move, just being sat in my new home, in my new town, away from all my friends, and feeling just really lost, really depressed, and this just filled with a sense of despair. Because this moment wasn't just an interruption, this moment was a disruption, that there was no way I was ever going to get back what I'd left behind. Now, what's interesting for me is the, the thing that changed me most and caused me to grow most as a human being was not breaking of my arm, but the moving on my home. I think we need to, to pay attention to the moment, right? We need to think about what this moment is. Is this moment an interruption that if we just wait long enough, if we just outlast the crisis, then we'll get back to the way that things were we can go back to the lives that we had or is this moment a disruption where we can never really go back to the way things were another question to ask is in this moment there may be things that we can we can make choices about we can choose whether it's going to be an interruption and we go back to the way things were or we can choose to let it be a disruption to truly change us and grow us as human beings Now, if it's an interruption and we just want to go back to the way things were, all we have to do is wait it out. But if it's a disruption, if we want genuine change in our lives, if we, if we don't just want to go back to the way that things were, then we need to choose a disruption. And to choose disruption is to, to say, I want to press the reset button. You know, in life, we don't get a chance to rewind. But this is a moment where we get a chance to reset to realign, to refocus on the things that matter most. Luke 5, um, 33 to 35 says this. It's Jesus being questioned by the Pharisees. And the Pharisees said to Jesus, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. So the Pharisees come up to Jesus and they say, all of our disciples and John the Baptist's disciples, they fast, but your disciples, they don't. They, they seem to be feasting and, and fasting is an important spiritual habit. Why aren't they doing it? You see, fasting... Uh, there's many reasons why people fasted. Fasting is to go without something in order to remind yourself of something more important. Fasting is, is a, an art of taking something out of our lives to remind ourselves of the things that matter most. It's, it's actually an act of resistance against a life full of distraction. There are many other reasons why people would fast. Maybe you can leave in the comments some of your thoughts about why people fast. But I want to focus in on this idea that fasting 
is a spiritual habit that is an act of resistance against a life full of distraction. I go without one thing to remind myself of the thing that truly matters most. And so fasting is like letting the apple fall on your head. We all know the story, right, of Sir Isaac Newton as he sat in his garden and the apple falls on his head. And suddenly he puts language on this invisible force, this invisible power that had been present in everyone's lives, but they'd never been able to name. He calls it gravity. And actually, I think there are so many invisible, unseen, unspoken forces that are at play in our lives and shaping our hearts and our minds and the way that we see the world and the way that we live that we haven't paid attention to, that we haven't put a name on, that we, whereas gravity was this inevitable thing that whether we name it or not, we're going to live under it. There are these other things that aren't inevitable, they've been assumed. We've taken on mindsets and a way of thinking and a way of living without necessarily putting a name on them. Fasting is a moment where you you take some of these things away. You allow yourself to put a name on some of the unspoken forces that are at work in our hearts, in our minds and in our lives. A really interesting example of this, I think, is um, from a documentary that I was watching recently about the Chicago Bulls. And in it, one of the Chicago Bulls players, a guy called Scottie Pippen, uh, they're focusing in on him and they're talking to his brother about their childhood. And their childhood, they grew up in this small, um, materially poor town called Hamburg in Arkansas. They even describe the the basketball nets as like dusty and rickety. But in it, his his brother is speaking about their lives and he said this thing that kind of just hit me like a lightning bolt. He said, everybody knew everyone and everyone shared everything. It was just a good time. And then he said this thing, which blew my mind. He said, we didn't even know we were poor. We didn't even know we were poor. Actually, what he's saying there is poverty wasn't something they lived in. Poverty was something that they learned. Can you, can you imagine this, this life where you genuinely knew the people that you shared your life with and you knew them so well that, that you could experience like this this generous community where people share with one another and and not only that but it's a joyful community where you just you feel like you're having a great time and life's good and full but then being told that that kind of life is poor now what is it in our world that's teaching us that that kind of enriched life of deep connection and joyful generosity is a poor life We, we need to take a moment, and, and fasting is a way of letting the apple fall on your head to see the powers that are at work in our lives that are teaching us about ourselves and about the things that matter most. I was um, listening to an article, um, a podcast recently. Um, Jefferson Becky uh, was telling a story originally told by David Foster Wallace, and the story is of three fish in a, a fishbowl. Uh, two younger fish and one older fish and the younger fish swim up to the older fish and the older fish says to them hey how's the water and the two younger fish look at him really confused and then they say what's water and his reflection was that so often in our lives we're not the older fish but the younger fish that we haven't paid attention to the water that we're swimming in We haven't paid attention to the culture that's shaping our hearts and our minds and our lives. The the beliefs that are shaping the way that we uh, see the world and live in the world. Maybe this is a great moment as kind of life is not as it used to be. And we're experiencing a real interruption, if not a disruption. Perhaps this moment is a moment to to start paying attention to the water that we're swimming in. You know, what kind of water are you swimming in right now? What are the things that are 
surrounding you and shaping your life? Are you swimming in a, a water full of peace and joy and fulfillment? A water full of hope and contentment and joyful generosity? Or are you, are you swimming in water that leaves you anxious, despairing, feeling a sense of hopelessness, feeling this congested hurry? Maybe you're, you're swimming in water that just leaves you with this deep-seated rage or this sense of disconnection where you know loads of people yet you feel really alone. Maybe you find yourself swimming in a sea full of distraction where everywhere you look, your attention is being taken away from the things that truly matter most. What water are you swimming in? So the Pharisees, they come up to Jesus and like, why are your disciples not fasting? Why are they not taking part in this act of resistance against a life full of distraction? And listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says this. He says, um, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? What Jesus says is he equates First of all, he says, the reason why they don't fast is because they're with me. And, and life with me is like being with the bridegroom at a wedding feast. You know, that's not a time for fasting. That's a time for feasting. And what does that mean? Does that mean that life with Jesus is a life full of distraction, that we don't take a moment to remind our hearts and souls of the things that matter most? I don't think it is. I think the reason why Jesus uh, life with Jesus is like a wedding feast is because Jesus is the ultimate fast. Now bear with me. W what I'm not saying is that Jesus is the ultimate life of lack. But instead, Jesus is the ultimate reminder of the things that matter most. Can you imagine walking with Jesus every day of your life? Because if you walked with Jesus every day of your life, the one who mattered most was right in front of you. You were constantly reminded of the things that matter most. And, and actually, when you look at the way Jesus interacted with his disciples, he was constantly calling them back to the things that mattered most, constantly calling them out of a life of distraction into a life of purpose and meaning and fullness. He's saying, you know, peace is not found there, it's found here. Don't chase after this thing, instead chase after your Father in heaven. Don't fall into the trap of distraction. Instead, live, live a life of deep meaning and purpose, centered around the things that matter most. And the reason why their lives were centered around the things that matter most was because they were with the bridegroom. That actually, a life centered on the things that matter most is formed by abiding with Christ. The more we pray, the more we commune with him, the more our hearts and our souls and our minds are reminded of the things that actually matter most. And we begin to see the water for what it is. We begin to see the invisible forces that would shape our lives for what they are. And we're able to center ourselves and center our lives around the things that matter most. Now, what does Jesus say matters most? What is it about fasting that's meant to remind us? Well, fasting is a reminder. Often it was to do with food, that you would go without food to remind yourself that your true hunger is for God in heaven. You would go without food to remind yourself that your true sustenance, your true nourishment comes from God himself. The thing that mattered most was connection with our creator. In fact, what did Jesus say? Jesus says the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Actually, what Jesus says matters most is a life of deep connection, a life of deep connection with your creator, to know him and to walk with him and to taste him and enjoy him, but then also to to have deep connection with your neighbor, not just your physical neighbor, but your, your family and your friends and your, your work colleagues, that you'd feel this sense of connectedness with one another, but also 
within yourself that you would know yourself and understand yourself as you connect with others and connect with God. That what we need most is a life full of meaningful connection with God and with one another. And actually what Jesus would say to us is that we are not flesh and bone. We're not just skin and a skeleton. We are people with hearts and people with souls. And we need to pay attention not just to our physical well-being, but the condition of our souls. And where our souls are most nourished is in connection with God, in connection with others. That's where the life is. That's what matters most. And actually, when we walk with the bridegroom and we find our lives centered around the things that matter most, not distracted by all the other noise, by all the other things that are going, that are swimming all around us, but when we focus in on the things that matter, he says, that kind of life is like a feast. It's like a wedding feast is what he says. He's the bridegroom. We come together for a wedding feast. And what's a wedding feast like? Well, in those days, a wedding feast wasn't just for a day. A wedding feast was for a week. It was an extended period of joyful celebration centered around two people coming together in deep and meaningful connection. This is joyful celebration of connectedness, but also like who hurries through a feast, especially a feast that lasts five, six, seven days. You know, this, this feast is a life of unhurried joyfulness where we can eat and truly be satisfied, where we find space to dance wholeheartedly, to listen fully to one another, to to converse richly, to, to enjoy life, to drink deeply and find ourselves truly satisfied. Jesus says, the way you do that, the way you find a life full of deep meaning that's, that's rich and fulfilling and meaningful is to abide with me, to spend time with me, to walk with me. And I will, I will teach you the things that matter most. I will show you where there is destruction and where there is purpose. Just, just come to me. Walk with me. Listen to me. And you will find a life full of rich meaning and purpose. So a few final things to take away. A few things that I would love you to do is I'd love you to take a moment to decide whether you want to just be interrupted and wait things out or whether you want your life truly to be disrupted, to experience deep and meaningful change that will enrich your life in the future, that will mean that your life is centered around the things that matter most. So a few thoughts. Number one, I want to invite you to lie down on your deathbed. I want to invite you to lie down on your deathbed. I want you to imagine that this moment is your last moment. And that the life you've had is all you'll have. And I want you to think about how you would feel about that. I want you to think about whether you, you've given yourself meaningfully to the things that matter most. Or whether you've allowed yourself to become distracted by the, the water that you're swimming in. I was reading a book recently by Christopher Hitchens. And it's called uh, Mortality. And the book is written after he's been diagnosed with terminal cancer and he's kind of wrestling with his inevitable death. And it's a yeah, heartbreaking book, a really kind of moving read. But in it, there's, there's one phrase that he talks about as he's wrestling with his inevitable death. He says, I can't shake this feeling of gnawing waste, this gnawing sense of waste. And what he goes on to say is how he felt like there was so much more he had to give, that so much of his plans were going to be left unfulfilled. And I, I pray that that is not the reality of our lives. I pray that as we lie down on our deathbed, we, we don't feel this gnawing sense of waste, but this deep sense of contentment that we've given our lives to the things that matter most. So that's the first thing. I want you to lie down in your deathbed and reflect on the life that you've lived. If this was all you had, how would you feel about that? 
Second thing, I want you to let the apple fall on your head. I want you to, to reflect on the water that you're swimming in. To, to not just take on and assume everything that you're told, but to reflect on the unspoken, unwritten rules that seem to be shaping our lives and our society. Are they enriching your life? Or are they robbing you of fulfillment? Final thing to say is I want to invite you to reflect on whether you want to press the reset button or not. Do you want to go back to the way things are? Do you want a richer, fuller, deeper, more meaningful life, free from the distractions that rob us of the things that ultimately fulfill us? If you want to press the reset button, the best way to press the reset button is to choose to abide with Jesus, to choose to, to follow his way and not your own way to choose to to listen to him to to follow his teaching to follow his commandments so that he might show you what a life full of meaning and purpose truly looks like maybe you've not given faith much of a a chance maybe you've not given jesus much of a chance what i would say is if you are wanting to explore this and if you're wanting to find out more about life with jesus let me suggest that you try following him for a month. Just try following his teachings. Just try following his rhythms, following his priorities and seeing how it changes your life. So there we go. Three things. Lie down on your deathbed. Let the apple fall on your head. And choose to press the reset button. We're going to explore more over the coming weeks about what that looks like. Um, but for now, we're going to pray. Jesus, I thank you for our time together. I pray that you would fill our lives with deep meaning, that we would find ourselves free from distraction, and that you would teach us and show us the things that matter most, and that we would center our lives on those things. I just want to finish with a blessing. May you know the peace and the joy and the contentment of life with Christ. May you drink deeply. May you dance hide. May you listen carefully. May you find true contentment and true fulfillment as you abide with Jesus. God bless you all. Love you and I'll see you again soon.